Okay, we started off seven weeks ago <clears throat> by referring to the old hymn. That is just as relevant and new today in some ways than it was 250 some odd years ago. The song written by John Newton, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Amazing words from an amazing man who had an amazing past as a slave trader. God brought him to himself and he couldn't stop thinking about God's amazing grace extended to him. You know, I don't know about you, but I take a lot of things for granted. I don't know, maybe it's just me. But I find that I take a whole lot of things for granted. I've lived on Molokai now 18 years. In fact, it's 18 years this month that uh, the Manley family moved to Molokai. And I find that I take a whole lot for granted on Molokai. I mean, I, I drive off of uh, the mountain over here in Kalai almost every single day. And I remember for the first, I don't know, maybe year, months at least, coming down off of that mountain on a clear day and seeing the water and seeing Lanai and just going, man, I live in Hawaii. I mean, this is amazing. I can remember you know, going to the beach on the West End when there's just these huge waves and just being fascinated. You know, growing up on the East Coast, our waves don't get that big. And so you see these big waves and just being just in awe and fascinated. Watching an incredible sunset. Living in a small community where, you know, you know people so well. And after a while, I start taking that for granted. I just don't think about it much until I leave. When I leave for a little while, and like we did the last few days, and fight the traffic in Honolulu and see the craziness over there, you go, man, we got something really good over here on Molokai. Right? But I take it for granted. I mean, we, we take things for granted all the time. At least I do. I mean, I think about things like communicating with people. You know, um, most everybody today has some kind of cell phone. M more people now have smartphones, you know. I still got the old flip deal because I'm just amazed that I can make phone calls anywhere, you know. But most people now have the smartphones. They can go online anywhere. We can communicate uh, just about all the time. Unless, of course, you live in Kalai and it's a dead zone and you can't do that. But, um, but we take these conveniences for granted. We were just talking to Reese the other day, my oldest daughter, and she's in college in California. And, you know, we were just kind of reminiscing about when Louise and I were in college, there wasn't cell phones. Um, we lived in dormitories and on our floor there was 80 plus students that lived on a floor and on the floor with that many students there were three pay phones and so we were fortunate to get a call home once a week would be a, a luxury uh, usually it'd be more like once every couple weeks and and then you know you would hope that you either had enough change or there was somebody home on the other net end to take the collect call, which if you're under 30, you probably don't have a clue what a collect call is. <laughs> um, but, but if that didn't happen, you know, you, you were stuck for another week or two before you got a call home. Reese calls us every day, <laughs> sometimes multiple times in a day. And, and then that's not to mention, you know, FaceTime, Skype, that you can actually see the person you're talking to. I mean, it's Jetson kind of stuff. Again, you know, that's probably more like <laughs> if you're over 40, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, but we, you know, I'm at a point where I just kind of take all that stuff for granted until I stop and really think about it. You know, we get frustrated when, oh, doggone it, I left my cell phone in the car. Or, man, battery's dead. What am I going to do now? What'd you do 10 years ago, you know? That we take those kind of things for granted. We, we just, I, I find myself just taking all kinds of things for granted. I 
getting into a car, sticking the key in, turning it, and it starts up, and you drive down there. I take that for granted. I expect it, and when it doesn't happen, I'm mad. Why doesn't this stupid car start? What's wrong? It's supposed to start up right away. Um, you know, we, we, we come to points in our life where, where things just become so routine that we don't even think about them anymore. They're just kind of mundane. They're just kind of there. They're part of life. We've taken the last number of weeks and we've zeroed in on grace. Talking about grace. And, and, and I hope, my prayer is, and I shared this with you on the first Sunday that we started this, my hope and my prayer is, that you and I would become more and more amazed by grace over our time together. That, that we would be able to sing along with that song that we just heard. Man, your grace, God, it still amazes me. It's not old. It's not mundane. It's still amazing. But the truth of the fact is, folks, that... If you've been with us through these weeks and you have learned some things about grace and you have been amazed again by it or maybe amazed anew like I was 20 some years ago when I began to really study it for myself and I realized, man, grace really is an amazing thing. The, the, the fact is, you probably will get to a point where it's going to get a little bit mundane. You won't think about it that much. It'll just be part of what happens. And, and I would love it if we could safeguard ourselves against that. Because what happens is if you and I begin to just take for granted this amazing grace that's been extended to us, then we'll stop being people of grace. And this, this place here will never be the grace place that God wants it to be. So as we close out our time in this series, I want to share just some thoughts that I've had over the past week to ten days that I would like to throw out at you and, and, and just share with you on some things from God's Word that I believe will help us to continue to stay amazed by grace. And the first thing I want to do is do a little bit of a, a review and if we go back, we want to remember what grace is, right? And in its very simplest definition, grace is getting what you don't deserve and could never earn. Grace is a freebie. You can't earn it because that would be a payment. It would no longer be grace. You don't deserve it because if you deserved it, again, that means that you did something to get it and thereby would make it some kind of a payment. So it's no longer grace. Grace is getting something you don't deserve and you could never earn. And it's so important that we keep that definition in the forefront of our thoughts and our mind. Because if we don't, then we get other things mixed up with grace. We begin to think that we earn grace or we deserve grace and that's not grace anymore. And so it's really important that you keep this simple definition in the forefront of your thought. Man, I don't deserve it. I can't earn it. That's what grace is all about. That's amazing. And I don't know about you, but I want to continue to be amazed by the grace that God has extended to us. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, we, we've been in 1 Peter once or twice before in our series, and I think it's an appropriate place to end, because Peter, the Apostle Peter, was writing to a group of believers, Christians, Christ followers, who were suffering. They were struggling. They were going through hard times. In fact, they were in a situation where if they bought and sold and others knew that they were Christians, Christ followers, they weren't allowed to buy and sell anymore. Uh, they were being denied many things that everybody else could have because they were followers of Jesus Christ. And so he writes to them and encourages them on how they can sustain under suffering. That's really the the, the theme of 1 Peter. How to sustain under suffering. And by the time he gets near the end of the chapter, he's starting, to, he's starting to close things out in this letter to these folks. And he writes this in chapter 5, verse 1. If you have your Bibles, follow along with me. He says, therefore, based on everything that I've said to you, all the encouragement that I've given you, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder, and witness of the sufferings of Christ, 
and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, you, elders, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, for God is opposed to the proud, but he does what? Gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. These folks were suffering, they were struggling, they were going through hard times. He's written to encourage them. And if you follow the, the, this letter of 1 Peter from the beginning until this point, you'll discover that he, he hits them in a bunch of different areas to encourage them. He encourages them with, uh, with uh, their work. He encourages them on what do you do when you have a, 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 a boss over you that is, is uh, giving you a hard time because you're a believer? What do you do if you're in a marriage and your spouse is not a believer? And, they're getting, and he talks about all these different things. And by the time he gets to the end, now he zeroes in on the church. Because these folks were all followers of Christ. And so he wanted to leave them with some final thoughts on what they needed to remember as a church family. And he addresses, first of all, the elders, the leaders in the church. And he encourages them by saying, look, shepherd this flock. Shepherd the flock, the people under your care, leaders. He says, shepherd them, take care of them. And he goes further and he, he describes it like this exercising oversight. In other words, you've been given a responsibility to oversee these folks. Oversee them well. And then he says this, proving to be examples to the flock. In other words, leaders, don't just, don't just take care of them. Don't just oversee them. Be an example that they can follow. That they can look to you and say, well, I'm not really sure how to do this following Christ thing, so I'm going to follow him because I think he knows what to do. That's really what he was saying. So in other words, in verses 1 through 4, if we could summarize it, he's telling them, lead well. Leaders, lead well. Hey, you're going through some persecution, some suffering, and some struggling. Leaders, remember, lead well. Don't lose sight of that. You have folks under you. You have sheep under you as a shepherd. Lead well. Be an example. Exercise oversight. Be a good leader. Well, that, that, was his, that was his encouragement to the leaders of the church. Then in verse 5 he says this, you younger men, or literally you younger ones. In other words, those of you that aren't elders, those of you that are younger perhaps in age, but perhaps also in faith, maybe those that hadn't been believers or Christ followers for very long, he, he says this, be subject to, to the elders. What was he meaning by that? Well, subject is the same idea as submissive. Line up underneath them. Because see, these leaders, these elders, they are lined up underneath God. They are responsible to God for you. And so you line up under them. And if you are following them the way that you're supposed to be, everything is lined up right and well. And it'll be good. That's what he was saying to them. And then he says this. He's addressed the leaders. He's addressed those younger in faith. And then he says, if you didn't notice, all of you. Now who do you suppose in the church all of you would refer to? I think it probably, written. this is deep, so hold on to this. I think it probably refers to all of you. What do you think? Yeah. He's addressed the leaders, the younger ones in the faith. And now he says, I don't want to forget anybody. So he says, all of you what? Clothe yourself 
in humility. Man, this is so good, folks. <laughs> this word for clothe yourself, it was a word that was also used for an apron wore by a slave, a servant. The word there for clothe yourself literally means tie on. Tie on this apron's servant. So we could translate this like this. All of you put on an apron of humility. Now what do you normally think of when you see a person in an apron? Oh, there's an executive. There's a guy that owns the company. No, what do you normally think of? You see a person in an apron and you think, there's somebody low on the totem pole, right? There goes the dishwasher. There goes the guy that's scrubbing in the back, right? Or maybe we go further and go, there goes the scrub, right? Because when you wear this, the apron, it doesn't mean you're top guy. It means you're bottom person. And so Peter says, listen, as you're struggling and as you're suffering, I want to encourage you. And as I encourage you and I want to give you direction as a church, elders, leaders, lead well. Hey, you're responsible for a lot. Lead well. And you younger ones in the faith, line up underneath that. Don't fight that. Don't balk it. This is the way it's supposed to be. And all of you, hey, pick up the servant's apron. Tie it on. Clothe yourself in humility. Why? Why should I do that, Peter? Because God is opposed to the proud. He opposes the proud. But he does what? He gives what? Grace. To who? The humble. You want to know a key in grace? It's right here. Would you put this down under that bullet point? Proud people don't accept grace. Proud people don't accept grace. Let me go a step further. Proud churches don't accept grace. You know why? No need. I, I don't need what you got to give me that I, you think I don't deserve. I don't need. I got it all together. I get them. Right? I, I don't need it. I don't need what you have for me. Now we wouldn't say this maybe as a church. God, I don't really, we're, we're doing fine. Just on our, our own. Day. We got all we, we, hey, just we'll check in with you when we need you. See, proud folk don't accept grace. But I want you to notice what it says here because this is so important. God, it says, is opposed to the proud. That word oppose literally means he set up against them. It was, an, it was a battle word. It was a military word used for an army that sets themselves up against the enemy. God says, oh, you want to be proud? Guess what? I'm going to humble you. I'm going to set myself up against you because you need some humbling. You say, wow, that doesn't sound very loving. That, that sounds just like that God that you told me a few weeks ago. I wasn't supposed to be picturing the God that's ready to step on me whenever I do wrong. Not at all. You realize that that's a picture of grace right there? God wants to pour out grace on you and me. He wants to. But He can't do it when we're proud. Because proud people don't accept grace. So in order to get us to a point where we accept grace... He's got to humiliate us. He's got to bring us to a point of humility. And so, so Peter, in his response to these folks who are suffering, he says, look, continue to tie on the apron as a servant and just stay humble because that's where God can dump grace all over you. Isn't that great? You want grace? You go, man, I don't know why God is pouring out His grace on me. Well, maybe you're not humble the way that you need to be. See, we have a tendency to compartmentalize our lives. And this, this side over here, this part over here, I really need God on. But this, I got this one. I, this is fine. And this one, God, I don't need you here either. And, 
eh, maybe once in a while here. No, no, it can't be that way. We've got to be the kind of people that are just constantly, constantly at that point where we go, wow, you know what? I really need it. Would you put this down? I know we skipped this, but I did it on purpose. To be continually amazed by grace, you must be, what do you think? Humble. Thank you. Humble. You've got to be humble. You, you won't be amazed by grace if you don't think you need it. Yeah, I needed it to get saved. I don't need it to live. I got all that together. No, you don't. You are fooling yourself at best. The enemy has fooled you. He has come in and tricked you to think that you've got it all together and everything's great. And you will wake up one day and you will look back on 15 or 20 years and you go, oh my gosh, was I an idiot. I thought I had it all together. I thought things were going well and I needed God that whole time. Man, why wasn't I humble enough to accept His grace? And if you and I are going to continually be amazed by grace, we've got to be humble people. And it didn't strike me until just the other day. In fact, it, it hit me, it hit me while I was listening to somebody else give a sermon. And it had nothing to do with what they were saying. And I know that happens to you sometimes, too. I don't know what he's talking about, but I just got this great idea and you start writing down. But a beautiful picture of exactly what we're talking about can be found in one of the most familiar passages of Scripture that there is. Even people that don't follow Christ, even people that don't go to church all that much, love this passage. And it's the 23rd Psalm. And if you got your Bible, I want to encourage you, turn there. Psalm 23. Because this is a fantastic picture of where you and I need to be in order to be constantly amazed, continually amazed by grace. Now some of you have it memorized and that's great. But sometimes it helps to see it again. The psalmist writes here, the Lord is my shepherd. Literally, I don't have any need. Why? Because when the Lord is your shepherd, he's dumping grace all over you. See, because sheep need the shepherd. You understand that, right? Sheep without a shepherd are dead. L literally. Sheep need a shepherd. And the psalmist is writing here, he says, Lord, you are my shepherd. I, I know that I need you, and if I have you, I don't have any needs. He, the shepherd, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Grace, he leads me beside quiet waters. Mm, grace, he restores my soul. Oh man, grace. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Man, I don't have it together, but as long as I'm lined up under the shepherd and I'm following Him, man, grace is just all over this deal. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, hey, it doesn't say that He's going to lead me away from the valley of the shadow of death. It says even though I walk where? Through it. What's going to happen? I don't fear. Why? Because you are with me. What is that? That's grace. I'm in the presence of grace. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Not away from my enemies. Not away, so, but right in the presence of my enemies. Because I am with you, I can... Be at peace and at rest in the presence of my enemies because you provide for me more grace. You've anointed my head with oil. That means when I, when I get bus up, you're there pouring grace on me. My cup overflows. With what? What do you suppose his cup's overflowing with? Grace. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. Now catch this. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you understand what the psalmist is saying here? Your grace will take me through life and right into the next one. Isn't that beautiful? That's what he's saying. The 23rd Psalm is about a humble man waiting for God to just pour grace out. See, because God is... 
opposed to the proud. But he can't wait to dump grace out on the humble. You want to continually be amazed by grace? I do. I want our church to be a grace place. I want us to be people that are constantly amazed by the grace of God. Then we need to be a people that are humble. God, we need you. And we need you for everything in every circumstance. Humility comes, would you put this down under that star that's there? Humility comes when you have a realistic view of who you are, where you've come from, and what you need. When you realize who you are, man, I... <laughs> who am I in the midst of Six billion plus people on this planet. Who am I? I'm not much. Where I've come from? Well, the Bible says before I came to Christ, I was an enemy of God. I was lost in my trespasses and sin. We talked about all this the third week we were together. We talked about how grace works. And where we've come from and what we need. God, I need you. In fact, this Tuesday night, in the Bible study of Mauna Loa, they're going to be looking at John 15. And the first part of John 15 is all about how desperately we need Him. And it'll say right in that passage, if you haven't read it, folks, uh, that are there on Tuesday night, that without Him, you can do what? He is the vine. We are the branches. And without Him, we can't do anything. See, humility, true humility comes when you have a realistic view of who you are. You know where you've come from. You know what you need. Now can I go back and quote that first line from Amazing Grace again? Now listen to it again. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Do you think John Newton had an idea, a realistic view of who he was, where he'd come from, and what he had need of? This was a man that was continually amazed by grace. And if you want to be continually amazed by grace, it takes humility. Here's number two. And this is found if you'll flip over to Matthew 18, because this is another passage that I want you to see. It's a story that Jesus told. And it was a story that he shared about forgiveness. And if you remember, we talked a few weeks ago about one of the key ways to demonstrate grace is through forgiveness. Because even part of that word has the word give in it. And grace is all about giving. Forgiveness many times comes in a situation where a person doesn't deserve it and they certainly never could earn it, but we extend it. And Jesus was asked by one of his disciples, well, how many times should I forget? Seven times? That seems like a good deal to me. And Jesus said, no. And I'm telling you, 70 times seven. Somebody goes, well, how many times is that? That wasn't the point. It was, a, it was a, an expression like, like we would say today, if somebody said, how much should I choke? Choke times. That's really what Jesus was saying here. He wasn't giving a specific number. He was saying, just keep doing it. Keep doing it. And then he tells this story. Verse 23 of chapter 18. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now in the context of today's money, that would literally be millions of dollars that this guy owed. This guy, this king. In verse 25, But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children, and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So this king, this lord over this guy, says, Look, you owe me. I want the money back. The guy says, I don't got it. He says, Okay, good. This is what we're going to do. And this was common practice in those days. You and your family will be sold into slavery so that you can earn the money to pay me back. But the reality was this guy owed so much. There's no way as a servant, a slave, he would ever be able to repay this king. And that's the picture here. So the slave, verse 26, 
He fell to the ground. He prostrated himself before him saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you everything. No way. Fat chance. It ain't going to happen. Verse 27, And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and he released him and he forgave him the debt. What a beautiful picture. No, there's no way you're ever going to be able to repay me. But I see your contrition and I'm going to have compassion on you and I'm going to extend grace to you. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. I'm going to give you forgiveness. Verse 28, the slave went out and he found one of his fellow slaves who had a hundred denarii. Small amount. Real small amount. He goes out. He's, oh, I can't free, man. No more debt. This is amazing. Oh, that guy owes me money. And he goes over and he grabs this guy. Look what it says. Uh, he began to choke him, verse 28, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell down and began to plead with him. Look like a familiar scene. Began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. Same words. Same words that the first guy used with the king, the second guy uses with the slave. Uh, be patient with me. But he was unwilling and went and threw him into prison until he should pay back what he was owed. No, I'm not going to forgive you this debt. I am not going to extend grace to you. In fact, I'm throwing your sorry butt in jail until you pay me back. So when his fellow slaves, verse 31, saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported it to their Lord, that what had happened. Then summoning him, the Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? Hey, I extended mercy to you. I extended grace to you. Shouldn't you have gone out and done the same thing? You should have done exactly what I did in the way that I treated you. Verse 34, And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed. Whoa, what's going on here? This is a picture, folks, of you and me. God extends grace to us. See, there's a point in our lives where we all, you will never become a follower of Jesus Christ until you come to the point of humility, first of all. See, you have to come to a point of humility where you say, okay, I get it. I can't do anything to bridge the gap between me and God. That takes humility. When we come there and we say, yes, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that you're giving me this grace of salvation and we accept it. Hey, that's a cool thing. That's an exciting thing. But then, then, he extends that to us. We are supposed to out, go out and be grace extenders ourselves. And this picture here is this guy gets this massive debt paid for, a debt he could never repay, just like you're in my debt to God. We never could repay that. And God extends forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And yet, here's this slave. Now he sees a brother who, hey, he owes me, and I'm going to get it back. No grace for you, buddy. And so in this picture, the king brings him back, and he says, okay, you want to go by justice? You want to live by justice? Okay. We'll live by justice. Let me show you what that looks like. And he rescinds his gift and he throws him in jail. Because he wants this guy to see, you want to live by justice, we'll live by justice. You want grace, I'll give you grace. But if you want to live by justice, okay, we'll live by justice. Guess what? You're in big trouble. Do you see the picture here? God is saying, I have extended incredible grace to you, church. I've extended incredible grace to you, Christ follower. You go out and you be those that extend grace yourself. Verse 35, my heavenly Father will also do the same to you if you, if, 
if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. What does that mean? God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That's what that means. Now this does not say that the guy got thrown into hell. Notice that. He was turned over to the what? Torturers. Hey, you want to go through torture? Stop extending grace. That's what he's saying. There's plenty of torture out in the world, amen? And God says, okay, go ahead. You want to live by justice? Justice is, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, we'll just kind of stop this relationship here where we're not in sweet fellowship anymore and you try to live the world without grace. Go ahead. Go ahead. And guess what? It's torture. Absolute torture. So would you put this down for number two? To continually amaze people with grace, you must be humble. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's worded a little bit different. To continually amaze people with grace? Yes, because you and I are supposed to be extending grace and people should be amazed by it. They should be amazed by us and the grace that we extend. They should be going, wait a minute. This isn't normal. This isn't natural. You're right, it's not. It's by the Holy Spirit of God working in us that He allows us to be grace extenders this way. And the only way I can do it is to be humble. See, this guy, this servant, could not extend grace because he was not a humble man. He had been humbled at one point when he stood before his Lord. But then when he saw his fellow servant, he said, Man, you owe me. There was no humility there. You give me what you owe me. And if not, you know what? I'm going to flex my muscle a little bit and throw you in prison. There's, there's all about pride going on there. There's no humility. Folks, listen. If we want to be people that are continually amazed by grace, we've got to be humble. If we want to be people that are amazing other people by the grace that we extend, we've got to be humble. It's all about humility. It's all about, hey, I didn't deserve the grace I got, but you know what? That's okay, because I'm going to keep extending it out this way too. And you know where that begins? That begins right in this place. That next bullet point, proud people. Proud people, they don't extend grace. Proud people don't extend grace. I'm not going to give something to you. You earn it. Hey, come on. You want me to be nice to you? Come on, what's in it for me? You want me to give you something? What's in it for me? See, proud people, they don't extend grace. Humble people extend grace. We want this place to be a grace place. I hope you do. I hope you want this to be a grace place. I hope you want people to talk about this place, not because, oh yeah, you know, there's oh, this going on and that going on. They do this. No, no, no. I, I would love it if people stood back and said, yeah, I heard about that church. Man, they forgive the strangest people. They forgive the strangest things. I think they really love each other. See, it's got to start right here, folks. It's got to start right with this room. We've got to be people that are amazing each other by the grace that we're extending to each other. But, but you know what happens, though? We don't do it. Because we, somebody, somebody rubs my fur the wrong way. Somebody does something. I just won't, I just won't hang around them. And then we'll have peace. Peace. That's not peace. You know? Oh, I'm so glad. So glad that the church is growing because, you know, when it's smaller and I had to, I had to actually walk by so-and-so on Sunday morning. Now I don't have to. I can slip out the side and I don't have to see them. Because you don't know what they did to me. You know? We had this business deal and they, they screwed me, man. Yeah. I mean, I don't blame the church, but I don't want anything to do with them anymore. Hey, you know what? We had this thing going. We were friends. We were friends at one time. And I don't know what happened. Just all of a sudden, one day they started treating me weird, you know? They started, like, giving me the eye and stuff. And I'm like, what's that all about? Okay, well, you want to play that game? Look at this. <laughs> and we do this stuff to each other. In here. And I got to ask, where's the grace? This is supposed to be a place that's overflowing with grace. 
We're the bunch of people that say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a bunch of wretches like us. Of course I'm going to forgive you. I don't want to. <laughs> but I'm going to because... Man, if grace doesn't start in here, how on earth are we going to demonstrate it out there? If you go back to 1 Peter, we read this in verses 6 and 7. Therefore, based on this idea that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time. Oh, I love this. Casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Guess what? Humble people have anxieties because you really bug me sometimes. And that makes me really anxious because I want to, sometimes I want to just tell you what I think of you. Sometimes I, you know, when you're walking by and there's a group of people, I just want to stick my foot out and watch you trip. I want to hear about your car breaking down. I want to hear about your relationship going south. I want to hear, I won't, oh, oh, I'm, don't worry. I'm not going to cheer outside, but inside there is a party going on in there. But see, when I humble myself before the mighty hand of God, God, I know I'm supposed to love so-and-so, but I'm struggling. I know I'm supposed to extend them grace, Lord, but they don't deserve... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Grace is something that's not deserved and can't be earned. Okay, God, I get it. I get it. Lord, please help me. You put this down for the last one. To continually be amazed by grace, you need to be anticipating grace. See, because here's the deal. As I humble myself, God promises I'm going to dump grace on you because proud people can't receive grace. But when you're humble, you're ready. And God says, man, I, I've been trying to do this all the time, but you keep rebuffing it with your pride. And now that you've humbled yourself, here it comes. Anticipate it. And when I anticipate it coming this way, guess what? It should be coming out this way. Coming out this way. Oh, it's not going to be easy because we're not God. And that's why we have His Holy Spirit in us to help us do those things that aren't natural on our own. But I've got to extend grace to you. Oh, don't misunderstand. We talked about this before and if you don't remember it, then go online and listen to the message again. It's not about license. It doesn't mean that I'm just going to let you get away with your sin. I love you too much for that. And part of grace is discipline. Because I want the best for you. God wants the best for you. So I'm not just going to say, oh yeah, you're doing this, you're doing that, and that's sin, but I'm just going to let grace cover it. No! Grace is about me coming to you in love and saying I care too much about you to let this slide. But grace is also going, you know what? I don't know so-and-so very well. And, and, and I realize... I've formulated an opinion about so-and-so, and, -so and I, don't, I don't know him. Wow, that's not very gracious of me, is it, God? Hmm. Wonder what I could do about that. What's that? Get to know them better? Hmm. That sounds like it might work. You know, God, I, I knew this person in a different context in the past. I mean, and, and what I knew about him in the past is pretty bad. And, but I realized I don't know him in this context. I have no idea what God's done in their life. I, I, hmm. Maybe I should find out. And when we begin to get into each other's lives and learn who we are and stop putting on... These, these preconceived ideas and anything else that we... Then we can start extending grace to one another and this place becomes a grace place and people go, wow, what's going on with you people? We go, We're just a bunch of people that are amazed by God's grace. And it's going to show because we're humble people.
not proud people. Because proud people, they can't accept grace. Proud people, they can't extend grace. It's only humility that puts us in that place where we can continually be amazed by grace. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes?